Hello, everybody. This is the Reverend Dr. John C. Dorhauer, General Minister and President of the United Church of Christ. And I am here with a dear friend and colleague, uh, Kent Salati. Kent, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you, John, for this conversation. I'm Kent Salati. I currently serve as the, one of the bridge conference ministers of the newly created Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ. Prior to that, I served as the conference minister of the Connecticut Conference, the Florida Conference, and was on the staff of the Connecticut Conference before that for a whole lot of time in conference work. <laughs> well, for our listeners, I'm going to be carrying on conversations with key leaders across the denomination, uh, and Kent is certainly one of the most well-respected and well-known. Um, Kent, let me ask you a question. What are you seeing right now um, from the perspective of where you sit? as a leader in the church? Well, we're certainly seeing a lot of things. Um, so much information, almost information overload in the times in which we live. I think one of the things we're seeing is churches trying to figure out how to be the church in this time, how to respond to the needs of their communities, how to engage in the feeding programs, um, things like young people shopping for older adults, how to use one's building when one is not in the building. Can it be offered to the community for a certain way? I know some churches have offered their spaces for unhoused persons um, and other options for the community to use the building while they're not in the building. I'm also seeing churches reaching out um, to their members, um, trying to stay connected um, in whatever way that's possible using social media using telephone calls, using emails, um, and we have more Facebook live streaming going on. I think we're gonna break the internet um, if we keep doing this. I'm also seeing people of goodwill trying to stay connected. Um, in my neighborhood, kids are writing messages with different colored chalk to their friends to remain hopeful. Um, we have neighborhood sing-alongs going on in some of our communities, keeping physical distance. Christmas tree lights are being popping up and we're meeting neighbors that we don't normally see in the course of our week because we're out walking and engaging one another in some new ways. I'm seeing artists who are offering concerts for free um, from their living rooms. And oddly enough, I see people craving human connection when a hug would really help. People are anxious, people are frightened, People also, um, some of our less than better natures are coming out as people fight over toilet paper and sanitizer and hoarding things that they don't really need. And part of what, you know, if you think about hoarding, it's really an issue around control. And when things seem out of control, sometimes the behaviors that are manifested um, are not the most positive. So, so mm -hmm. we do see some of that. There's some panic. There's fear, there's anger, there's sadness, there's confusion, and there's de despair. And I see that, John, in particular around funerals and memorial services as loved ones die. Right. And can't be there to offer a reassuring hug, a touch on the arm, um, some kind of embrace. That's really difficult for those um, particularly tender times, those tender moments of time. And finally, John, I see people pulling together. Um, you know, the, think about the people putting their lives literally on the line. Doctors, right. nurses, healthcare professionals, and even grocery store workers are putting themselves at risk. So um, there's a lot going on during this time. Thank you for all of that. Let me, my next question, and I'm going to do a follow-up to this. Um, what are you learning? I think and I hope and I pray that what we're learning is that this time of physical distancing is a really important moment um, that we need to figure out how to remain connected in this time. So we're learning some new ways to do that. But we're also learning that we are connected. Um, and that this time of social distancing, physical distancing is allowing that curve, if you will, to be flattened. So we're learning something about, while I might not be feeling ill 
at this moment, it doesn't mean that I can just go out and, and be in a public way. I think we're learning how to put the least among us first. Mm. After the initial shock that we're going to be um, in physical isolation for a while came on, people began thinking about their own needs. But I think that's turning now. And I think people are asking the question, how do we put the least among us first? I think we're learning how to do excellent online worship. And that doesn't mean polished. It means authentic and real. And some of the best moments in some of the online worship services that I've experienced have been sort of when the gaffes come or the cameras turn the wrong way and people are talking to you upside down. Um, but that's <laughs> real, right? It's real. And so we're learning how to be real with each other. We're learning new ways of being together. We're also asking what our churches need at this time. We sent out a survey to all of our congregations about what they need rather than presuming that we know, know what churches need during this time. And it's really, again, about that human connection. How can you help us be connected to each other using the technology that's available to us? Um, and I think we're learning as we go along, John. I mean, none of us was trained for a global pandemic. Right? right. We've not been here before. Um, so I think we're learning as we go along. And I hope and pray that we're learning how to be gentle with each other, how to extend authentic grace and compassion and love with to each other um, and to recognize that we're all literally making this up as we go along. Thank you. Here's my follow up. Uh, from what you're experiencing and even maybe projecting out a little bit about what you anticipate, are these things we're learning going to be shelved when this is over is just, well, that's what we did during Corona or does this create new behaviors for us? It creates new behaviors. There is no question. I don't think we're going to be able to go backwards from here yeah. depending on how long this lasts. Um, you know, people are saying, well, 14 days later and it's all going to be over. That's not true, right? No. We're, we're learning more and more about that with the science um, that is made available to us. Um, so, yes, I think, I think we're learning something about what we set, have said for, for many years, that the church is not the building. We're practicing the Pentecost movement of the church has literally left the building and has is now out <laughs> right. in the communities, right? In, in the various communities where we find ourselves. So I, I would hope and pray that what we've discovered about physical distancing does not mean that we can't be connected to each other. In fact, I think this highlights the way in which we are interdependent, the way in which we need each other during this time. So I'm hopeful um, that's part of my hope, but I'm hopeful that the new things that we've learned, I don't think church can go backwards from here. Yeah. I think that's wise on your part. One last question. Where are you experiencing hope in the midst of all of this? I would say the hope is that this crisis has pulled us together like other crises, crises that we've been a part of in our life that, um, it brings out the best in many people. Um, and so even in my little neighborhood here in Middletown, Connecticut, we have a pizza shop where they are bringing pizzas to the hospital for the healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they have been flooded with people bring, giving donations to help feed the staff who are putting their lives on the line. It's that little mm -hmm. thing that crisis brings us together. I also see hope um, in, in the faith. The faith is that quiet confidence that no matter what we face, God will give us the strength to face it. And I think we're needing to depend on that reality in some really new ways. I see hope in our resilience um, and our dependence on each other and our recognition of our connections with each other. So I don't, as you asked the, the earlier question, I don't think we can go back from here. Yeah. I see hope in that. I think we're realizing some new things about us being together that gives us hope. So there's lots of memes out there, right, in social media. Anybody, you know, monitor your social media time. I have to do that myself. But there's <laughs> lots of things out there. And this Roman Catholic laywoman, Linda Fanucci, has written a prayer. And I want to just share a little bit from that. 
it, it, it's about the hope, right? Yeah. She says, when this ends, may we find that we have become more like the people we wanted to be, we were called to be, we hoped to be, and may we stay that way. Wow. So we face an unknown future, but I think we face an unknown future with hope and confidence that neither death nor life nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's where my hope is. <laughs> That's beautiful. It's powerful. Um, it, it just sort of reminds me that you have been among the leaders who have been inviting the church to think about what change is coming. And we, you know that oftentimes that's met with such reluctance. And we've now been forced into a situation where we have to make those adjustments. And um, sure. yeah, th this could end up being a gift to all of us, which often is what happens from the midst of suffering. You come out the other side, not just changed, but changed in a way as uh, the woman that you just cited noted, is what we had always hoped to be or become. Well, Kent, I want to thank you. As always, your insights um, express wisdom and uh, are of great interest to all of us. So thank you for this time in conversation. Thanks, John. Appreciate it.